My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. Now, the other day, I was in my hometown in Maine, Sanford, Maine, 20,000 people, and I had dinner with a buddy of mine from high school, and we were talking about high school, because high school for both of us, I mean, for a lot of us, but particularly for my friend and I, not an easy place. I was picked on so much. I probably deserved half of it, but not 100% of it. And he was too, and we were just talking about it. And we were talking about how that likely fed into our imposter syndrome. The notion that, you know, you're not worthy of stuff and you sort of like show up to places. And when you're from a small town in Maine and you go to a university far away or you get a job in a big city, you're like, what am I doing here? And I had a lot of that to deal with. And I still, you know, I'm still overcoming that to some degree. Of course, sometimes we overcompensate. Maybe I've done that too. But it is a thing that a lot of people deal with. And so I was thinking about this a lot because I had just interviewed my guest today who wrote a book called Imposter No More, Overcome Self-Doubt and Imposterism to Cultivate a Successful Career. And so it was like, I was, I was just telling him what I learned from this interview. This interview is a good one. You're going to love it. Now, my guest today is the author of this new book. Her name is Jill Stoddard. And Jill is a passionate person who shares her science-backed ideas about psychology to help people thrive. She is a psychologist, PhD baby, a writer, a TEDx speaker, an award-winning teacher, She's the co-host of the popular Psychologist Off the Clock podcast, which I was on a couple of years back. It's a great podcast. And she's the author of three books, The Big Book of ACT Metaphors, A Practitioner's Guide to Experimental Exercises and Metaphors in Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Say that three times fast. Woof. Number two, Be Mighty, A Woman's Guide to Liberation from Anxiety, Worry, and Stress Using Mindfulness, and her new book, Imposter No More. Now, her writing has been all over the place, Psychology Today, Scary Mommy, Thrive Global, The Good Man Project, and Mindful Return. And she is on media all the time. She's on lots of places. In fact, I introduced her to a friend of mine who writes for the Today Show. She's on their blog as well. So she's just doing a lot of stuff. And she is really nice and smart and lives in Newburyport, Massachusetts, which is a beautiful place, by the way, with her husband, two kids, and disobedient French bulldog, which I've met on a podcast episode. He is, in fact, rather disobedient. Now, here's what I said about her book. I was really kind of honored that she asked me to blurb her. And so this is what I said. I said, now more than perhaps ever, we expend precious time and energy on behaviors that are self-defeating and that sow doubt in our own capabilities. Imposter No More is your handbook to taking back control at work and in life and get back to building. So that's the whole point. Builders can't be caught up in this imposter stuff. I mean, we you're going to hear in the interview, I'm sort of like, I wish I was a little bit more like Elizabeth Holmes because she, I mean, she was an imposter, but she had no imposter syndrome or, or imposterism to deal with. But um, we don't want that either because that's just, you know, she's in jail, right? But I wish, and I'm working on overcoming my imposterism. So that's what the whole episode is about today. It's a doozy. And if you like the episode, and I hope you will, please share it. That's my small ass this week. Share it with somebody, somebody who deals with this. Because guess what? It's kind of, well, you're going to share it with everybody because this is pretty, pretty pervasive stuff. All right. Thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. And now on to the interview. Now, as you know, I like to start every interview with the same question. And so I started our conversation with this. What's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? Well, this might be a little bit like vague and over general, but I think uh, this is a formative decision that I feel like I have to make a lot, which is essentially saying yes to opportunities, even when I feel terribly insecure or, you know, full of self, self doubt or uncertain. You know, when I think of the most important professional opportunities I've had starting my own business, joining a popular podcast as a co host. Uh, doing a TEDx talk, 
you know, these are things that that just really triggered all of my self doubt and and imposter thoughts, which we're going to talk about today. You know, so really learning how to say yes to those opportunities amidst all of those negative thoughts and difficult feelings has been would that that's what comes to mind when you ask that question. I feel you because I. It's funny. I um. I struggle with this continually where even in things that I know I'm really good at and that I've done successfully in the past, but like say I get asked to get, do a keynote somewhere, I'm doing some keynotes this fall for some big events and I'm like, well, like, you know, I feel happy to be doing them, but I'm like, are these people going to really think I'm any good or, you know, what if, um, I, what if, you know, I, I don't do a good job and I've done hundreds of these things. But I, I have that in a lot of different areas. We're starting a new company. So it is, it's something that I super understand that I have as kind of part of my personality. And what I'm happy is that you're, you're a psychologist, so you're going to fix both <laughs> of us today and all the people listening. Definitely. Or not fix, it's, fix help. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's get, let's get into it. I want to just start with like, what was the, you mentioned this kind of as your decision, but why did you write the book? I mean, I wrote the book. I think, you know, they say research is me search, right? And it really comes from this personal place of recognizing that I guess I just, I thought that the more I accomplished, the more these thoughts and feelings would go away, right? As long as your resume was imp- impressive enough, eventually you would feel confident and you would stop worrying about being outed as a fraud. And like the opposite was true. And I just found that really fascinating. And as I started talking to colleagues about it, people who are really impressive, people I see as like even more successful than me, they all had this same issue. And that was just sort of mind blowing to me. And I thought, you know, that this is just something that we need to talk more about and like give people some skills to be able to, when I think about how many people succeed despite having these thoughts, it then makes me think, but how many people are out there who are not going after the careers that they want? because they're having these thoughts and, you know, maybe there's some, some way to like help boost those people, like help them to cultivate a successful career if they're, if they're holding themselves back because of this. Yeah. It it makes me think too. It's like, you know, those people who have no imposter, we're going to talk about the use of the word syndrome. I'm going to call it syndrome for now, but we'll change that. But those people like Elizabeth Holmes, I'm like, if I had a little bit more of that in me, what you know, I would have, I'd have no limits, right? But I would never, right? There's no way it's going to happen that I would just have that level of confidence. Well, and she's in prison, right? Like a, a little humility and a little self doubt might actually be a good thing, right? <laughs> Listen, I'd like to be a little more like Elizabeth Holmes, but I get your point. I don't want to go to jail, and I don't want to lie to people or do right. anything unethical. You, you early in the book, you talk about the fact you, the, the word imposter syndrome or the phrase imposter syndrome, you choose not to mm-hmm. use it. Why is that? And what do you propose? Yeah. So there's really kind of three reasons. The first is that it appears that like 70% of us will experience this. And so that means the majority of us. And if that's the case, then it simply can't be a syndrome. It's just normal right? If like most of us have this experience, it's not pathological. So that's one reason. You know, another reason is when this phenomenon was first identified back in the late seventies by um, two women, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes, they called it the imposter phenomenon. And at the time they thought that it only affected high achieving women. And then lo and behold, shortly after something that only affected women came out into the world, it got relabeled as syndrome. And I don't think that's a coincidence, right? I think like, oh, women don't have confidence that they must have a syndrome. And even though the research on this really is sparse, which is sort of shocking, you know, you do a Google search and you get tens of millions of hits, but there aren't a lot of really rigorous scientific studies. But there are hypotheses out there that sort of common sense seem to make sense that it may be the case that experiences of marginalization make these thoughts and feelings more likely, right? If you have a history of being told you don't belong at all the tables, you're going to question whether you belong at all the tables. And so really, this is a cultural and societal kind of phenomenon rather than a psychopathology, right? So again, shouldn't be a syndrome. And then I think the final thing is that calling it a syndrome sort of suggests that it's like 
an individual personal problem. Like there's something wrong with you that you need to go fix. And it really sort of ignores that piece that I just talked about. It sort of ignores the role that discrimination or bias or, you know, just us swimming in these cultural waters can have and puts the onus on the individual to change rather than, you know, which I think I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't think if I wanted to give individuals tools to be able to manage these very normal feelings. But I also think we need to look at, you know, organizational and systemic levels um, or issues that contribute to this too. FOMO. FOMO. So let's get into some of that. You you use the the term, I believe, imposterism. Is that... Is that what, okay, we're going to go with that. And which I like, I think it's, is it's a, it's a really elegant way of saying the same thing. Let's get into the root causes. You mentioned some of these systemic cultural issues. Like what are some of the things, if we look at folks who struggle with this, that where is it all coming from? Yeah, it's from? a good question. And you know, the truth of the matter is like, we don't really know, but again, like hypotheses, certainly I think systemic bias has a role. of us experience it. So probably there's some evolution involved here if this is something that affects most of us. You know, and when you think about early humans, those who hunted and gathered and traveled together had a survival advantage, right? We don't have sharp claws and teeth and run at fast speeds. We have each other. And, you know, so we're, we are social creatures. We need each other to survive. And so checking your status in a group, do I add value? Do I measure up? Am I good enough? was a way to ensure survival. Because if you, if the answer to those questions is no, then you're risking getting kicked out of the tribe and it you literally will die. It is a life or death situation. And, you know, fast forward to today, of course, being kicked out of a group is not life or death in a, in a really overt, clear way, right? You're not going to get attacked by a predator. However, there is now loads of research that has found that really the number one strongest predictor of overall physical and mental health and well-being is our quality relationships, right? Like our, this, like us being in relationship with others is kind of life or death, right? There's one study that shows that, you know, loneliness is deadlier than cigarette smoking. And the, the Surgeon General came out with a huge report about this epidemic of loneliness and the way that it's negatively affecting us. So, you know, I think that like evolutionary social creature thing plays a role in us worrying about whether we measure up, you know, not getting outed essentially is, which is what imposterism is. And then I think in addition to that, there are um, experiences in our learning history. So if you had parents who are highly critical, it's going to mean you'll develop an I'm not good enough story. And the imposterism part is kind of an offshoot. Like, if people find out how inadequate I am, you know, they'll expose me, I'll be exposed and I'll be outed. And interestingly, I think the opposite can be true. If you have parents who are like your biggest cheerleaders, but for dumb things, right? Like they're so happy that you went down a slide. Then even that, like, even if you're little, you sort of know that maybe you didn't deserve all those accolades. And so that that can kind of result in these kinds of thoughts, too. So the bottom line is we're screwed no matter what. (laughs) We're all going to experience it. Wow. It's very interesting uh, uh, that you say that because if, uh, you know, some folks believe and this is where we get into like. I think dealing with different, you know, some solutions to some things may cause other problems like um, that it's important to praise your children for everything they do and make them feel special, even if the special thing is like very inconsequential. But I think if you what you're kind of saying is if your parents spend all their time telling you like you're really, you know, lionizing things and giving you participation trophies for everything, it sort of cheapens accomplishment. And you start to believe that sort of like, well, whatever, like what they're saying is they're just trying to be nice. nice. Mm -hmm. And exactly. And I actually don't have any sort of things to show for it. I, I, I got to ask you, when you talk about this, it reminds me a lot of FOMO in the sense of being, the fear of being excluded. It is the same thing. And, and what I've looked at, I've been doing a lot of research on the biology of FOMO mm. and the fact that, you know, you talk about this fear. It, it really, you, you have this fight or flight and the, the, the epinephrine releases and you just sort of like 
freak out. Is that kind of a similar, is that kind of where we're going here? I mean, I certainly think that can be the case. You know, anytime Hmm. fear or panic is triggered, you have that fight, flight, freeze reaction that's meant to keep us safe away from danger. But, you know, we have these brains that don't often distinguish. Like I use the metaphor of when your smoke detector goes off, Sometimes it's because there's a fire, but a lot of times you just burnt your toast and we have a fight flight reaction in both of those instances. And we're not always really good at discerning a true danger or emergency versus a perceived danger that isn't actually dangerous. And yet we respond to it in a similar way and then often kind of like avoid out of that fear, even if that has a cost and doesn't really serve us. All right. So you, uh, you have identified subtypes and I thought it'd be interesting to choose a couple of those. I'll let you, I think there are five, there are five. if I recall correctly. Yeah. Five. So choose, choose two of them and tell us about okay. those subtypes. So first of all, they're not my subtypes. This, these were identified by Valerie okay. Young. So I just want to give credit where credit is due. She wrote a book about imposterism several years ago. Um, and we have a very different mm. approach to how to manage it. Um, But she identified these subtypes, which are basically, in order to avoid feeling like a fraud, we develop these kind of unhelpful ways of trying to prove our competence, but they often end up backfiring. And so um, one of those, and, and this is my subtype, so it's very familiar to me, is called the expert. And I think this is one that a lot of high achievers, um, you know, in the business world, especially relate to. And it's The expert is someone who feels like to demonstrate competence and to prevent being outed as a fraud, you need to make sure that you have the right amount of skill, experience, knowledge, ability, competence, but there's never enough. There's always more, you know, I think of it. And so you're always like getting degrees and listening to podcasts and reading books and talking to experts and and a lot. And there's nothing wrong with skill building and acquiring knowledge and lifelong learning. But there's often a um, like not really knowing where to draw the line between learning and doing like we do too much learning and wait until we feel ready to do the doing. And I always I get this image in my mind of like a cup where you're trying to get the cup to fill up, but there's a hole in the bottom and it never really quite gets topped off. Um, So that's the expert. The other one that pops into my head that and it seems to be just in my own data collecting, which is, um, you know, not, not through a university, but my own sort of like anecdotal kind of data collecting. I developed a quiz that people can take to identify their subtype. And the two that have come up the most frequently from the couple thousand people I've, I've collected these from are the expert and what's called the superhuman. And the superhuman is the person who thinks that they need to be able to juggle all of the balls all of the time, even if they're on fire and do it flawlessly with a smile on your face and never let them drop. But of course, this is impossible. And at some point, a ball will always drop. And to them, that proves that they're incompetent and that they're a fraud. And really, they think they should be able to add, you know, a stick on their nose with plates spinning on it. Wow, you're looking at me because you know that's me. <laughs> I, I think that's I think that's my tendency. Yeah. I think that's my tendency. I think you chose that because you knew. Um, I think I have learned to manage that to some degree. I think life is a teacher. And so, you know, and I I just sort of like tried that so many times and went so poorly that I've had to back away. But that is my natural tendency. No question yeah. about it. So let's talk about then. <laughs> I love it. Uh, let's talk about then. Um, if we think about this, like each one of it has its own journey and its own set of solutions. So I'd love to hear some of the ways that let's choose the same. Let's go with the perfect, sorry, the, 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 um, the expert and the superhuman. Let's talk about how each of them can uh, sort of address these tendencies. Yeah. Well, in reality, the way to go about dealing with imposterism in general, irrespective of subtype, it's it's really kind of all the same because there's just one goal. And the goal is to build psychological flexibility. And so what you see in past books, blogs, whatever you read about imposterism, the typical advice is you have to build confidence. You have to improve your self-esteem. You have to change your negative thoughts into positive thoughts. And you know, look, if you can do that and it works, fantastic, go for it. 
But for a lot of us, we find that that doesn't work, right? So if you're telling me that you're feeling worried about a keynote that you have to give and you're like, oh, what if it goes poorly? I could sit here and be like, Patrick, listen, you've done hundreds of these before and let me read off your entire resume and all the amazing accomplishments you've had. And it doesn't work, right? You can't change your thoughts to believe in yourself. Your mind goes, well, yeah, but what about this? And yeah, but what you can give me as many points as I give you for all the reasons that you should be worried about it. And so the alt- it doesn't address the root cause, mm-hmm. right? You're not getting a root cause. You're just sort of addressing the symptoms without sort of getting into the causation. It's it's I think it's more that our brains have a negativity bias. Like we our brains are mm. literally wired to overestimate the likelihood that something bad is going to happen and underestimate our ability to cope with it. And this is what our brains do to try to protect us. They want to make sure that we don't fail, that we don't humiliate ourselves, that we don't get kicked out of the group. And and so a lot of these narratives, these stories are, are hardwired. And so instead of putting all this effort into trying to change the way we think about ourselves, what we can do instead is change our relationship to those thoughts. And so um, building psychological flexibility is we, we know that this is a strong predictor of overall health and well-being, psychological flexibility. And what it means is our ability to be in this one moment, because that's the only one we've got, with all of our thoughts and feelings, physical sensations, urges, all of our internal experiences fully without doing anything to try to push them away or control them. And to make conscious, deliberate decisions about what to do or or not do based on our values. And our values are just like what we want to stand for, what we want to be about. I call it the me I want to be because it's easy to remember because it rhymes. Um, and that's psychological flexibility. And, and that's what, to me, is the most effective way to manage these imposter thoughts. Can I notice that I'm having these thoughts and sort of look at them rather than treating them like they're truths with a capital T? Can I open up and let myself feel the uncomfortable feelings and not let those feelings drive me into my comfort zone and like to go choose to do the, do the keynote because getting this information out into the world is like one of your professional missions, right? It matters to you in your heart. And maybe you want to be somebody who's courageous, even when you feel scared, right? Like that's what values are. What do I want to do and what qualities do I want to embody? How do I want to do it? that's reflective of how I want to be in the world and let that really be the, the, the guide rather than the thoughts and feelings. And we typically just kind of autopilot respond to thoughts and feelings in ways that can keep our life small. And the insight, if I'm, I'm going to reframe yeah. this a little bit, because I want to make sure that everybody hears it clearly, including myself, this is me talking to Patrick, is you have these feelings, you get all upset, you're caught in your head, you're stuck in this mental loop that is not serving you. You say, let's stop. Stop, drop, and observe. I love that. That's a new time. Just coin that term. Every SDO, <laughs> stop, drop, and observe. Um, it happened here. And look at what is happening and then start to engage in strategies to stop that process and to allow you to move forward. FOMO. FOMO. You talk about in the book. You have a number of different tools that I'd love to get into. There's a mindset element. There's a mindfulness element. You just mentioned values mm-hmm. a little bit. There is this inner critic. Um, you have us going to our funeral. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about some of these things. Um, why don't we start? I'm I'm really interested in kind of the mindfulness aspect of this because you know here on FOMO Sapiens we talk about this stuff. Um, we talk about mindfulness pretty frequently, and we always do it, or I try to do it anyway, from from a place that is that is not woo woo per se, but is really focusing on like, what is the the benefit, um, the tangible benefit of doing these things. I mean, the woo -woo part's good too. Like if you want to be woo woo, be woo woo, go and go to the monastery and sit on top of the mountain and do all those things. But for the, for some folks that's like, that's not comfortable. So it's also great to just like root it into sort of like an investment and a return on that investment. So let's just start there. Yeah. You sometimes hear people talk about like Mick mindfulness, you know, the way everybody's just kind of like glommed onto (laughs) this and like, how can I go use this in my wellness industry to profit and make money? And, and that is not the way Mm -hmm. I like to use mindfulness or teach mindfulness. And, and really in, for me, it's not as much about like sitting on a cushion and closing your eyes for 45 minutes. Really it's, 
you know, it's just present moment awareness. And you can be aware of the present moment using all of your senses. And then you can also be in the present moment becoming aware of your thoughts and your feelings. And what I think mindfulness does is it basically creates a bigger space between some kind of trigger and a response. So what we often do is we have a thought and we feel a feeling and we react on autopilot instantaneously without really stopping, noticing, or thinking. And what present moment awareness allows you to do is like take a beat so that you can check in so that you can stop, drop, and observe. Like that's really what mindfulness allows is to stop, drop, and observe. And then once you become aware, oh gosh, my mind is telling me that I shouldn't do this because you know, I'm an imposter and people are going to find me out. Huh, that's interesting. That's an old story. If I listen to that thought, is that going to serve me? Is that going to move me in the direction of my values, the person I want to be, or is it going to move me away? So you're creating this space through present moment awareness where you can choose a different response. Instead of just having a reaction on autopilot, you can choose a different response and that response can be based on values. And that's what it's about for me. Like, so you can sit on a cushion if you find that helpful in any way. Um, but really for me, it's, it's about like taking a beat, noticing the internal experiences and choosing a response that's values driven. That's great. It's, it's relying on the mind to be more logical than just letting your thoughts be hijacked by fear. And the other thing is when you stop and think about it, one thing you can also do is you can think about, I like how you said it's an old mm-hmm. story because I think about the times in the past when I was, a, you know, various points in my life, when I showed up at college or whatever, and I was like, what am I doing here? I'm not going to fit in here. And it all was great. Yeah. And, and I think I'm curious, like just, I, I, we were talking about it earlier. It's like, why am I feeling the imposter syndrome now? Because I've done so many of these things. I think it's because when you go to a new level, a lot of times it's like, well, I've spoken in front of 300 people. But now I'm going to speak in front of a thousand people. And even though it's kind of the same thing, it's this, you know, you're imparting the same message, you're using the same skills, it just feels bigger. And so you start to be like, like, should I really fill a room of a thousand people? Like, is that, it, it feels like that is part of yeah. it. Is that like, as you step up your game, as you progress in your career, you're always getting to a new mountain yes. to climb. And even though you've successfully climbed mountains and you have the boots and the skills and the, all the physical fitness, the mountain looks bigger than anyone you ever saw before. Is that I think relevant? that's a hundred percent relevant and you're exactly right. And in addition to that, so I think anytime we're doing anything new, where we don't feel mm. as expert as we think we need to be or as experienced. I'm experienced with 300 people, but not a thousand people that can get triggered. I also think that like the higher you climb, the more you're expected to know. So when I wrote my first book, of course I felt like a fraud because I'm not a writer. Who do I think I am to write a book? Now I've written three books, but now I feel like I'm supposed to know everything about writing books and the publishing industry and how to have a social media platform. And I still don't feel like I know enough and I'm good at So it just doesn't, I I spoke to an author who had written 27 books and said, so was the 27th one, the one where you no longer felt like a fraud? She's she's like, I'll tell you when it happens, but it hadn't happened yet, Mm. right? It's 27 books. Now you're really supposed to be as expert as an author could possibly be, but you don't necessarily feel more, that much more expert than you were in the beginning. More certainly, but not more enough, if that makes sense. And like what Valerie Young says is now you have a reputation to defend, right? Oh yeah, and yeah, and that's the 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 bar in the beginning. It's all t- you know, it's just fun and games, and the expectations are low. And then if you wrote the bestseller, and I've seen this with friends of mine who had the bestseller and the second book flopped or whatever or didn't do as well, everybody is you know you have set up an internal set right. of expectations. People around you have them, and so even though you could have done very well. And by the way, it's, it's still a, a success um, because it didn't surpass somehow. It's right. a letdown. Absolutely. Or even thinking about you, like, who am I to go to Harvard? I don't belong here. But there's also this like, but once I go to Harvard, then I'll feel legit, right? But now it's like, shit, now I have yeah. to meet everyone's expectations of what it means to be a Harvard graduate. So it's almost like the more you excel, the more pressure there is to be extraordinary. 
Yeah. And no, I mean, I was like, what am I doing here? And it's, I still, I think every year you see your classmates achieving insane things and you have that reference anxiety and that can be you, that's just a road to perdition. You have to make a decision about no, it comes, you said values and this is like the perfect place to end because you, you talk about values as a way of overcoming this. And it's like, when I feel those feelings like, oh my goodness, this person's CEO of a public company, like what have I been doing? First of all, you can't be everything. So, you know, you cannot equal your, I can't be a partner at a law firm, a partner at McKinsey, an investment banker, a hedge funder, a CEO. All, it's, it's not happening, but I know what I care about. Yeah. And so I don't really care if somebody's like, you know, the metrics of other people, I don't really care about them. I have my own metrics. Now talk yeah. about the funeral and the epitaph. Cause I really love that as a way of giving yeah. some folks something they can do this weekend to, to work on this, this challenge. Yeah. It's, it seems so morose, but it can be so helpful. You know, if we, if we face our own mortality, it really does get us in touch with the things that are important. And, you know, one Mm. thing I want to say before we talk about this is that whole, like, you know, smoke detector metaphor. And it's like, if we're feeling pain, it's like our body's way of saying, oh, you should move away from this. If we're feeling fear, we're in danger. We have to move away. But if you think about like the last time you couldn't sleep or you were feeling anxious and you think about what it was that was keeping you up or what you were worrying about, it's not whether there's like going to be a new season of a show you like. You like the show a lot and it brings you joy, but it doesn't keep you up at night. The things that keep you up at night are the things you care about, right? So like often that imposter, like you're not worried about being outed as a fraud unless it's something you deeply care about. So I think this is important for people to know. It's like you can look to the places where you feel pain and struggle and distress. And that is like a bright red neon arrow telling you you're probably exactly where you're supposed to be. Because if you Mm. didn't care, you wouldn't be worried about it. And so we can like use those pain points to help us understand what's important to us. The other way that we can help try to uncover some of the things that matter and how we want to be. So you mentioned the epitaph exercise, which is just to think about what you would want your epitaph to say. So, you know, if you had a gravestone with a little saying on it, would you want it to say, you know, here lies Patrick. He was really good at avoiding his fear by turning down speaking opportunities so he would never be boring and would never fail. Or would you want it to say, here lies Patrick. He was really courageous and did scary things because getting his message out into the world was important to him, right? And so you can think of that, like, and that's a quick and easy way to really get clear on like what you want to stand for in your life. My epitaph, I've written it uh, already. Uh, I've, I've had it for a long time now, and I'll tell you what it is. Tell it is Patrick, here lies Patrick McGinnis. He was never bored or boring. Oh, I love it. I love it. And if you're not going to be boring, you have to put yourself out there in risky ways, right? It requires being vulnerable to not be bored and to not be boring. And vulnerability is what underlies a lot of this. We all try, you know, the root of the word vulnerable is woundable. And so we Mm. avoid vulnerability because we fear we're going to be hurt. But vulnerability underlies most of the things that matter to us most. And so the funeral exercise is just sort of fast forward to the end of your very long life. And if somebody were going to stand up and give your eulogy, speak about you in your, at your funeral, what would you want them to say about you, about the way you lived your life, about the way you handled, you know, those old stories that that's the self-criticism and the insecurity and the imposter thoughts and the anxiety. And you can even do kind of a part one, part two, like what would you want them to say when you're a hundred? And if they did it today, what would they say? And that can be kind of a painful discrepancy, but then it gives you a place to start. Like, ooh, I, how do I make this today person more like this future person? And that you know gives you some steps to start taking. All right, everybody, you have your homework for the weekend. There you go. Think about your death, but in a good way. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, the book is called Imposter No More. And if you want to find out more about Jill, you can go to jillstoddard.com. That's S-T-O-D-D-A-R-D dot com. You can also find her on Instagram at Jill A. Stoddard. Jill Stoddard, author of Imposter No More and host of Psychologist Off the Clock. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to reconnect. FOMO. 
If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.